We're going to give Evan the week off. If you don't know what that means, that means you've probably missed the last two weeks. We've been using the movie Evan Almighty as kind of a backdrop for this walk through Nehemiah, and we're going to going to give him the week off, and just in case you didn't know this already, I love movies. It's one of my favorite pastimes, that, and watching football, although I'm going to give that up for the rest of this season because my Dallas Cowboys lost. That's okay. That's okay. I'll still praise God anyway. But, but, oh, boo. Okay. So, so I love going to movies, and um, there's something that all movies have in common. At the end of the movie, they have these things called the credits. And you know what the credits are used for, right? The credits are the time that you start patting your pockets to make sure you didn't drop your cell phone or your keys. You, you start gathering up your jacket. If you're a conscientious moviegoer, the credits are the time that you start picking up your bucket of popcorn and your leftover soda and your boxes and your trash because the movie's over. It's time to go home. You know, that's the one thing most people don't do with the credits. Read them. You know, unless you have saw an actor in the middle of the movie that you, you thought, I wonder who that really was because I've forgotten their name and what else they played. But even now, we don't do that because now we just go home and we go up on IMDb and we search them out and we don't, so, so we don't read the credits. And I'm talking about the credits of a movie today because really we're going to look at the credits of this Nehemiah project today. If you have your copy of God's Word, I'd like to ask you to please make your way to, to Nehemiah chapter 3. We're going to go verses 1 through 32. And um, if you don't have your copy of God's Word, let me encourage you to go ahead and pull the one out in the pew rack in front of you. Find the book of Nehemiah. And as I let the credits roll, you read them. Nehemiah chapter 3. Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it. Even unto the tower of Mia they sanctified it, unto the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zachar the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassaneah build, who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Merimoth, the sons of Urijah, the son of Koz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabeel. And next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of Baana. And next unto them the Tekoites repaired. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of their lord. Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Pasea, and Meshulam, the son of Besadea. They laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Malatiah the Gibeonite, and Jadon the Moronathite, the men of Gibeon and of Mizpah, unto the throne of the governor on this side the river. Next unto him repaired Uzziel the son of Harhael of the goldsmiths. Next unto him also repaired Hananiah the son of one of the apothecaries, and they fortified Jerusalem unto the broad wall. And next unto them repaired Rephaiah, the son of Hur, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. And next unto them repaired Jadeah, the son of Harumath, even over against his house. And next unto him repaired Hadish, the son of Hashabniah. Melchijah, the son of Haram, and Hashab, the son of Paeth Moab, repaired the other piece, and the tower of the furnaces. And next unto him repaired Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. The valley gate repaired Hanan and the inhabitants of Zanoah. They built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and a thousand cubits on the wall unto the dung gate. But the dung gate repaired Melchiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of beth -Haxirim. He built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalon, the son of Kohoza, the ruler of part of Mizpah. He built it and covered it, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and the wall of the pool of Siloah by the king's garden, and under the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him repaired Nehemiah the son of Azbuk, the ruler of the half part of Bethzer, unto the place over against the sepulchres of David, and to the pool that was made, and unto the house of the mighty. After him repaired the Levites, Reum the son of Bani. Next unto him repaired Hashabiah, the ruler of the half part of Keilah, in his part. After him repaired their brethren Bavi, the son of Henadad, the ruler of the half part of Keilah. 
and next to him repaired Ezer the son of Jeshua, the ruler of Mizpah, another piece over against the going up to the armory at the turning of the wall. After him, Barak the son of Zabbai earnestly repaired the other piece, from the turning of the wall under the door of the house of Eliashib the high priest. After him repaired Meramoth the son of Urijah the son of Koz another piece, from the door of the house of Eliashib even to the end of the house of Eliashib. And after him repaired the priests, the men of the plain. After him repaired Benjamin and Hashab over against their house. After him repaired Azariah the son of Maaseah, the son of Ananiah by his house. After him repaired Benui the son of Henadad, another piece from the house of Azariah, unto the turning of the wall, even unto the corner. Palal the son of Uzai, over against the turning of the wall, and the tower which lieth out from the king's high house, that was by the court of the prison. After him, Padeah the son of Perush. Moreover, the Nethanims dwelt in Ophel, under the place over against the water gate toward the east, and the tower that lieth out. After them, the Tekoites repaired another piece, over against the great tower that lieth out, even unto the wall of Ophel. From above the horse gate repaired the priests, every one over against his house. After them repaired Zadok the son of Immer, over against his house. After him repaired also Shemaiah the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate. After him repaired Hananiah the son of Shelmiah, and Hanan the sixth son of Zaleth another piece. After him repaired Meshulam the son of Berechiah over against his chamber. After him repaired Malachiah the goldsmith's son under the place of the Nethanims, and of the merchants over against the gate of Mifkad, and to the going up of the corner. And between the going up of the corner under the sheep gate repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. Now, in case you're wondering why I used a recording there, did you see all those names? I don't think so. We'd still be here, me, me trying to figure out how to pronounce half of those. But, but I, I want you to pay attention to this because how can you do a sermon off just a bunch of big lists of names? Well, we're going to see if I can pull this off. But, you know, I, I, I look at that and, and I begin to question Nehemiah's sanity. Because Nehemiah went to the king and he asked for supplies and he asked for safe travel. you think he would have asked for a construction crew. But that's not what he did. And so as we're beginning to look at this, this project that Nehemiah looked at and took on, and we looked at the first week, we looked at step one, and he, he wrapped this project in prayer. When we looked at, at chapter one, we found out that chapter one is just one big, long prayer that Nehemiah put before God as Nehemiah prepared himself for this vision, this mission. Last week, after a week off from the snow, we looked at the nine actions that Nehemiah took to get himself ready for this particular project. There were a lot of things that he did, and, and prayer again was stuck in the middle of all of that. Nehemiah will find out praise all the way through this project. But this week, as you listen to, to chapter 3 being read to you, there is a phrase that just sticks out in that chapter because it's said over and over and over. And the phrase is next to. Nehemiah had a vision to rebuild this wall, but Nehemiah knew something. Nehemiah couldn't do it alone. As you listen to chapter 3, there was a Nehemiah mentioned, but did you notice whose name really wasn't mentioned? Nehemiah. Nehemiah wasn't out on the wall doing any building. Nehemiah had other things going on. There was a Nehemiah that did some building, but that's not the same one. So, so Nehemiah realized he wasn't going to show up in, in Jerusalem, and he wasn't going to pick up a hammer, and he wasn't going to move all these beams, and he wasn't going to clear all that rubble. He wasn't going to do this all by himself. Nehemiah was going to have to have help. The vision was going to take everybody working next to one another. And that's where our lesson is today. We want to take a look at this and we want to understand the value of working well with others. Now, there are some people at Lexus that would love to hear me preach this and would love to see me do this better at work because I want to tell you something. Sometimes I struggle being a team player. I do. You know, I, I'm kind of the person that, you know, I could probably do it quicker than I can explain it to you, so just let me do it. You just kind of get out of my way and let me accomplish what needs to be. I can get in that mode. 
My, 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 my family sometimes thinks about the just keep swimming, like little dory. You know, just keep swimming. Just, I just keep going and going and going. And then I get more and more frustrated. I'm like, why don't you go with me? Well, because you didn't ask me. So, so there is a value in learning how to work with other people and not doing things all by yourself, not taking on all the responsibility. And the first thing I want you to see when you're working with others is that these people that were there in the third chapter of Nehemiah, they were just a collection of ordinary people. I didn't see brick mason. I didn't see carpenter. I didn't see professional construction person anywhere on that list. You know what I saw? I saw priests. I saw goldsmiths. Okay, I guess maybe they had some, some wherewithal. I saw a perfume maker. I guess his part of the wall smelled good. Maybe he worked on the dung gate. That would work well. I saw governors. I saw servants. I saw merchants, people that worked in retail. I saw neighbors, just people that hung out in the neighborhood. I saw both men and women, and there were young and old. In other words, all of these people were just the people that were living there. They were going to do this project themselves. They were going to provide their own labor. They were going to put their own backs into this. And so when they began to think about rebuilding this wall, they began to think about next to, and well, the work was divided. Nobody had too much and nobody had too little, but I do want you to understand why the work was divided. It was not divided evenly. Nobody got out there with a tape measure or some patient and said, okay, we're going to go one, two, three. Okay, this is your section. One, that's your, I'm not going any further because I realize my stage ends right there. But, but they did not walk it off and give everybody the same portion. Some built large sections of the wall. If you read that, it talks about cubits. It talks about how big it was. They built large sections. Others worked on towers. Not only did they build the wall, but they got to the corner. And, of course, if you ever looked at an old-fashioned wall, when they get to the corner, they didn't do, like, beveled edges like we do. They would construct a tower that they could make the turnaround with it that would make the wall more solid and give you some place to put people in to kind of defend the city. So some people rebuilt towers. Others simply just managed to repair their own backyard. You see, this wasn't a thing of it was fair. You know, that's one of my pet peeve words at my house when somebody looks at me and says, it's not fair. My kids will know, tell you, my, my answer usually is, well, it's not a carnival or a circus either. It's not supposed to be fair, okay? And the work that was divided here on this wall was not fair. Everybody did what they were capable of doing. And as they did, well, there were various jobs. Not only was it not distributed evenly, some people did other things. There were managers. Now, these were the people that just supervised. You know, the managers are the people that just kind of sit there and tell you what you did wrong. But, but they're necessary evils. You have to have managers or things get chaotic. And there were people whose jobs were just to sit around and make sure the wall was sound. There were probably some building inspectors and people like that. You have to have those people if you're going to have a successful building project. Some people set beams. Now, I marvel at this. You realize who the beam setters were. These were the unskilled. This is where I would be if I was there working on them. These are the unskilled laborers. They just have to be able to lift and move. I could probably handle that, but, but they just set beams. If you read through that chapter 3, you'll see that's all some people did is they just managed to set beams. Others hung gates. Now, these were skilled laborers. You ever tried to hang a door? It's not an easy task. I'm so thankful that Lowe's has the ones you just kind of slide in place now. You just cut the hole big enough and you slide it and it's pre-hung. That's a lot easier, but, but there's an art to hanging a door. Well, there were obviously some skilled people there because these people hung gates. Others stacked blocks. Understand, if you're going to have a wall and the walls are made out of blocks, then somebody has to be the block stacker. Probably not a glamorous job. I got a feeling these, these block stackers kind of went home dirty during the day. I got a feeling their hands were rough and scarred because these weren't like Legos. I mean, these were these concrete blocks that were hewed. And people just had a job. That's what they did all day long. They just 
stacked blocks. In fact, as you look at that big chapter 3, there was only one blemish in the entire credit, and that was a group of nobles who they said they didn't put their backs into it. They just kind of took their job, and they were kind of like the people that just kind of stood there on the, on the eternal coffee break. You know, they just kind of stood around and waited for the, somebody else to do their work. So, so there were even those people, but there didn't seem to be a lot of those. Everybody was working together, and they all had one goal. And I think that's the reason this works. They all had one goal, and the goal was real simple. Finish the wall. Nehemiah must have been a genius motivator because Nehemiah got all of these people to somehow catch the vision, to take what skills that they had and begin to work together to rebuild the wall. That's amazing to me. And what's even more amazing? The work got done. The job was completed. Now, just so you know, this isn't the end of the book. This is the credits. I'm not sure why they didn't put this at the, like, chapter 13, but this is chapter 3. This is kind of a summary. We're going to go back and break down the actual building process. But the job eventually got done, and we're going to find out later. I want you to really wrap your brain around this. Trampas, you'll appreciate this much. It got done in 52 days. No mixers. No backhoes. No dump trucks, no steam shovels, no jackhammers. 52 days to build a wall around the city. That is truly amazing. But that is what it took when everybody worked together. The job just got done. And that brings us to our lesson today. Together in the church. I fully believe that God has called us to build something. And the something that I think God has called us to build is a vehicle that will lead people into a relationship with him. And I fully believe that, guess what? I cannot do this by myself. There is no way on earth one person could ever do this. Even Jesus didn't try to do this. What's the first thing Jesus did? Went to look for 12 more. So nobody can do this by themselves, so it takes an entire church to transform itself into a vehicle that will reach people for Christ. And there are some principles that we can take from this idea of next to, this idea of Nehemiah and how they rebuilt this wall. There are some principles we can look through the New Testament and we can apply it to our church today to see how God expects us to do the job and to get the job done. And it begins in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. We have to remember, we are one. Make every effort to keep your unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you were called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One. It isn't. My faith versus your faith. It isn't my style versus your style. It isn't this versus that. We are one. If you are here today and you claim the name of Christ and you're a part of his church, you are of one body that God has a desire for us to show our oneness. Now, I'm I'm not naive. I mean, I can count. I really can there is more than one person sitting here today. And, and that's important because while we are one, the weird part is we are many. First Corinthians says, and says here that just as one body through, just as a body through one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is in Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. I have a lot of organs in my body. I have a heart, and I have lungs, and I have kidneys, and I have, and I, I haven't sacrificed anything, so I have appendixes, and I, I'm still one, but all of it makes up one person. Very. But I have a lot of pieces and parts that go with me. And the church works the same way. While we have 
oneness because we are all saved through Christ. We are many, and we come from many different backgrounds and many different styles. And if we sat around and talked about it, we probably came from, from different parts of the country. If we, if we traced our roots back far enough, I know my, my sister is big into genealogy, so she tells me that my, my creasy side of my family, basically it is, it is over in England somewhere. We were on the boats coming over from England. That's where we came from. There is a creasy around here that misspells it. They have an E between the Y and the S. Just so you know, they just don't know how to spell. But, but that particular creasy, they came from France. They're not part of the same. We are one, but we are many. We have many different backgrounds. And guess what that means? It means we have many different rights. I don't like llama beans. I think they're disgusting. My wife loves them. I don't understand why, but my wife loves them. You know, I don't like all the same foods that you like, and you don't like all the same foods I like. And guess what? We don't like the same kinds of music, and we don't like the same kind of dress. And you know why? It's because we're many. And that's the, the great thing. You think about these people that were building the wall. I am sure they had differences. I'm sure while one person was working on the section of the wall and they had their, they had their boom box blasting a certain beat of music, maybe two sections down, somebody else had a different choir out there singing. Everybody had different styles, but they all still continued to work together. You see, just because we're different doesn't mean that we have to have differences. Just because we're not exactly the same doesn't mean that we can't all work on the same thing. But we have this idea that we want to allow our differences to divide us. And so we need to remember whether you are big, small, old, young, whether you grew up in this church or you came here, you've been here a while or you just got here, or maybe it's another church entirely or a different building, a different part. We're all still one body. God desires us to be one and to put our many together. And when we have many, we need to realize we have different skills and gifts. Continuing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, it says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all of them are but but in all of them and everyone it is the same God at work. There are things that I can do. You do not want me doing construction. Because I can't put a nail in straight. I really I'm not joking. I cannot. Ask you saw me try. It doesn't work real good. I am not a construction person. You know what else? You don't want me leading your choir. It would sound terrible. You know why? Because I can't sing. Okay, I can make a joyful noise, and I try real hard, but, but it's not my talent. You know, I understand that there are gifts and skills that God didn't give me. Now, God gave me some gifts and skills, and his, his expectation that I use those gifts and skills to further his kingdom. But you realize it's the same expectation for you. God gave you so many gifts and skills and talents, and the idea is, is that you would take them all and give them back into the church, and we would become one, and we would be able to use those gifts, skills, and talents to build God's kingdom. But we don't all have the same talents. We all don't have the same abilities. There are some of us that, that, that think we do, but we just don't. Nobody has it all. I think God did it that way on purpose. The reason nobody has all of the, quote, spiritual gifts is because if we had them all, then we would want to do it all by ourselves, and that's not the plan. It's supposed to be just like this wall. The reason Nehemiah is not even mentioned is because Nehemiah didn't do the majority of the building. It was other people offering what they could back. Even if all they could offer is, I can pick up a beam. I can do that. Everybody working Together, and we need to realize without everybody, we're incomplete. Now, if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed all the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. I love this verse of Scripture. Because my body doesn't get up in the morning and decide, the eye decide, well, today I think I want to be an ear. I'm going to hear all day long, and I'm not going to see anything. That would be a terrible thing. Number one, I wouldn't be able to see. Number two, I wouldn't be able to hear because guess what? The eye's not designed to hear. 
My feet can't do what my hands do. A lot of my body can't do what it used to do anyway, but that's okay. That's a completely different sermon for another time. But you have to understand that there are many, many, many parts, and your body has to function. Everybody has to do what they were designed to do. And the second something doesn't do what it's designed to do, you know what we call that body? Disease. I wake up one morning, and something doesn't work with my hand. What am I usually think about? Well, there's something wrong with the body. I better go find something, somebody to help me fix it. There are some parts, if we wake up and they're not functioning, we don't call them disease, we call them dead. If I wake up in the morning and my heart's not working, I didn't actually wake up in the morning, okay? Because that's just the way it works. Your body is designed, everybody has its own little part that it's supposed to do, and you can't trade your part because you don't think it's important. Every single part's important. Every little piece. Hanging as you go out the back door here, there is that puzzle that to this day is still missing two pieces. And the reason it's missing two pieces is because we gave that piece of puzzle out as part of a sermon, and we gave it out, and we asked everybody to get their, their, give their part back, and guess what? Two people decided to take their piece home. So guess what's going to happen? For the rest of the days that that puzzle hangs up there, it will always be incomplete. Because if you don't give your piece back to God, then God can't use it. And the body is incomplete. Imagine if everybody was out there and they were working hard and the one little person that just had the section of the wall in their own backyard decided, you know what, I just don't really feel like doing my part. Guess what would have happened? The wall would have had a gap. Somebody else might have had to stretch out and do their part, and then you would have had contention in, the, in this building project because then there would have been this idea, well, I did my part, why aren't you doing yours? That's not the way it's supposed to work. God wants us to be complete. And God wants you to understand that everybody is important. Sometimes we, we, we delegate and we think, man, what I do isn't that important. Well, just listen. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. If the head just decided to say to the foot, get out of here, then guess what? The head's not going anywhere. If the head decided hands get out of here, then it's going to be hard for the head to eat because the head doesn't have any fingers. Every little part of the body is important, and every little part of the church is important. It doesn't matter whether your job or your skill is to stand up here and preach a sermon on Sunday morning, or maybe you're part of the services. You do nothing but you pass a communion tray. It's all important. Maybe you're people that take care of the grass or you take care of some of the building maintenance. Maybe you handle the finances. You do realize all of the pieces of the puzzle fit together to make one church and every single part of it is important because if you notice when something doesn't get done, you notice. And we need to realize it's all important. And we also need to realize we are in this together. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26 says, If one part suffers... Every part suffers with it. I am learning this and through my own physical body. If something hurts, it seems everything hurts. Man, I've had a shoulder issue going on. I want to tell you something. I have had my shoulder is hurt, and every part of my body seems to be just screaming at my shoulder, would you please stop? Because you know what? Everything seems to hurt when one part of your body hurts. Every piece of the church, when we see suffering in the church, everybody feels it. When there's illness in the church, everybody feels it. When there's a death in the church, everybody feels it. We're in this together. We're all one part of one body, and everybody feels it when somebody is suffering. That's what it's designed to do. Because when we feel pain, then we tend to reach out to others, and we try to help that person. If we never felt anything, it'd be easier just to continue going on in my life and doing what I'm doing. But everybody suffers because guess what? We're in this all together. We have one goal. And I think we forget this sometimes. I think that we forget that the church has but one mission. I mean, sometimes we think that we like to think the church's mission is about making me happy. I hate to tell you this, God's not really concerned about your happiness. God's concerned about your salvation. God's concerned about your relationship with him. 
God gave a job to the church in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. We call this the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is the mission of our church in a nutshell. Now, we've got all the other cute little things that we wrap around it to kind of help us. You know, we have the, the community and the crowd, and we have the connected and the committed, and we did the shine thing. And we have things that kind of help us remember that. But when you boil it all down to it, that is what we are here to do. We are here to go out into a world. Okay, well, if you're going, you do realize that means you have to be portable. Okay? Going does not mean sitting. Going means going. So we are to go out into a world, and as we are to go, we are to be doing specific things, teaching and baptizing. We are to be making other Christians. We are to be spreading God's word as we go. That's the mission of the church. That's what we're supposed to be doing each and every day when I wake up. That is supposed to be the mission of my day is who can I reach for God today? Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to go out and give a five-point lesson on how to accept Christ every single day. And reaching somebody that day may be nothing more than a smile and a hello. Maybe it would be, be nothing more than a phone call of encouragement. I don't know what it would be, but we should wake up with that mentality. Whose life can I impact for God today? Imagine what would happen to the church if we did that. If we actually made that our goal each and every day, I want to know who can I change. Now, that would make me awful busy, and it would probably make me too busy to worry about some of the things I end up worrying about because now I'm only worried about the right thing. You see, I am convinced it is time for us to do building. It is time for us to start putting the pieces in place, and just like those credits, just like those people around the wall, God wants each and every one of us to commit our lives to a section of the wall. And maybe it's a big section, and maybe it's a little section, and maybe it's a section that's really torn down. Maybe it just needs a little spackle. Maybe it only needs a little paint. I don't know what your section looks like. What your section looks like, you know who that's between? You and God. I'm not assigning sections of work here, but I am telling you that God wants you to evaluate your life and take a section of the wall. And he wants you to reach that section of the wall for Christ. Maybe that section is no more than your own family. Maybe that section is your co-workers. Maybe that section is your neighbors. I don't know what your lifestyle is like as far as what time you can have and what you're willing to put into it. But here's what I do know. Everybody worked on something on that wall. And if everybody didn't work, then the wall would not have gotten finished. And we need to take that idea into our church. It's time for us to build. But I understand I can't build this alone. I can't do this all by myself. And you know what? Surprise, surprise. We can't do it with myself and a few elders. And we can't do it with myself and a few elders and somebody leading worship. It takes every single person pulling together, looking for their part in the church and doing what they can to further the church's cause. And the, per the church's cause is to reach people for Christ. So I want you to begin think thinking about your portion of the wall. Yeah, this is about to get real personal. I want you to think about your portion of the wall. How's the construction coming? Is it like one of those little projects that, that, that I tend to get into and you know you go out and you buy the supplies and you stack them out in the backyard and then it starts to have weeds growing over top of it? And you say, someday I'm going to build that? Or is it your wall is constantly under motion and moving and making? You do understand it's your portion. It's your section what God has given you to do. And I want you to use this time of decision to think about what it is God would have you to do. What is it that God wants you to do? What is it that he's asking you to help build? Who is he asking you to reach? Because if you're following Christ, it's somebody. Now maybe you're here today and, and you know what, this whole wall thing, you're, you're, you're just kind of like watching the construction, like the people going down the road. You ever watch people when you're going down the road and they're stopping traffic and you just watch the construction people. I, I always wonder why there seems to be more people drinking coffee than there are working. But there's got to be a reason for that. And they're probably the nobles. The ones drinking the coffee are the nobles. So, so now I understand. But, but you understand that, that as you go down, 
maybe you've just been watching this construction, but you don't understand what it means. Well, let me explain to you. There was a man that came and gave his life on a cross. His name was Jesus. And when it was all done, they put him in a grave. And then he rose again on three day, in three days. And he did all of that so that you could have forgiveness for your sins. And so this morning, I'd like to also invite you, maybe you're here today and you've never followed Christ. Well, this is the day we can take care of that too. And we can make you part of the team that's going to be building the wall to reach others. We're going to do a time of decision. And whatever it is that you need to do today, this time of decision, invitation, whatever you want to call it, it's always about what you need to do. Maybe you're here and you need to come forward to pray. We can do that. Maybe you just need to sit there and think quietly about your portion of the wall. Maybe there are other things that you need to do. Maybe you need to place your membership here. Whatever it is that you need to do, this is going to be your time. I'm going to ask you to please stand, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing, God will take care of you.